How I do, folk? I'm not trying to tarry here. So, I just want to get right to the point. And, uh, someone went in a chat had, uh, thinking they didn't see what I said. I kind of took it for granted that they had Moses to judge them. The people had Moses to judge them. And that's those that said they were under law and tried to put others under the law. So, I want to go to the Gospel of John, where he said, um, y'all will go, you know, across the seas for a proselyte and I'll point that out even though the proselytization isn't known much today amongst this group um, it was then clearly by the words of Christ but um, I'm here in John 5 and uh, it says there was a feast of the Yehudim and Jews went to Jerusalem and uh You know, th th for this reason, the Yahudim uh, persecuted him, in verse 16, and sought to uh, stone him like they did to Moses, sought, sought to stone Moses, in uh, Numbers uh, 14, I believe. But uh, he answered them, them, um, my father has been working until now, and I've been working. So as we keep on reading, he, it's all red ink, more and more red ink. Uh, all the way until he says, How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from only God? Do not think I shall accuse you to the Father. Because what is he accusing him? I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, like Judas came in his own name, you will receive him. Like they did with Bar Kokhba. And, uh, but Jesus, if you go to Isaiah 52, is the name of God. It says Yahweh Yeshua, Yehoshua. And, uh, I think that's, um, 52 too. And, uh, I say here in verse 45, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. So, um, there's lots of places, uh, like Luke, uh, 16, 29, where he said, you have the, the Moses and the prophets, they're not lost in the, listen to him, how would they believe even if, in verse 30, one rose from the dead? And for that reason, they weren't going to believe. Remember on the road to Emmaus, they didn't even recognize him, um, because they did they did not see his glory yet, you know, even though he had come glorified. And so, that's that's because of their mind's eye. So, when Christ said that you'll see him on the right hand of God in the clouds with the angels and all that, he was talking about how you visualize him in your mind. Because... The people did not believe him. They did not accept him because of he had to die. And, you know, if we just fast forward to John, I'll show, I can show you where Judas betrayed him at the talk of his, his, his death and burial. And this contradicted their earthly notion of Messiah and kingdom. They couldn't believe that that would happen. So the message was hidden to them. Who hath believed our report, Isaiah said. And um, he had made, Paul had said, he, from quoting from Isaiah again, that he had, he had made them blind. And Paul had said how Pharaoh was made blind to show his power. But what is his power? What's his direction? Well, Paul is kicking against the, the pricks, the, the, um, the goats, by following, as Galatians 1.16 says, the, um, their way. So if he is no longer following their way, then he's no longer kicking against the pricks because he is seeing this new heaven and new earth. Well, you got to understand that heaven and earth were these parallels that the Jerusalem was said to be a parallel on earth of heaven. Well, Jesus had said in the uh, Lord's Prayer that this hasn't happened yet. And so, 
uh, they, that was just something they were trying to do. But as they were following the Torah, they believed that, you know, doing that was what they were doing up there. But this, the Torah was supposed to be, you know, to curse them, to show their powerlessness, but which would wouldn't be in fulfillment of Psalm 82 to get their full potential as judge if they were still um, corrupt like that. And they couldn't take the roles of the sons of God to disenfranchise the gods of the nations and become like gods themselves until they did that. But as John 10, you know, he said that that's what their law says, that they ye are gods. And that wasn't just judge alone, that was divine judge because they had accused Jesus of calling himself and that's why they punished him according to John. And uh, the, the thing is, is we go to Ezekiel 33 and Ezekiel 34 and all that, the punishment was to the goats who were the uncircumcised. And they would try to imply that, circums that there was some identity between circumcision and the law. But this has a lot to do with their Egyptian and Babylonian roots. And their opposition to the Greeks and the Romans. And uh, for that reason, Ezekiel had talked about um, the judgment being that there would be no longer in in this garden of Eden that they would have um, no longer with Lebanon or Assyria or any of these other Egypt great places be the garden that reflects the the heaven above. It would be Jerusalem. But this isn't going to work really well because they did not recognize the time of their visitation. So he had to as Isaiah had prophesied, give them a new name, and that new name comes from him him peopling, as Isaiah said, the land uh, and and making it, you know, grow, uh, and so that they would inherit the nations. But how did this happen? Is the millennium, and the millennium. I would argue was the Christ Christianization of Jerusalem. That would be the new name, which started in 70 AD. And the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus was to teach their minds that all the, the law and the prophets was coming true at that moment. And it wasn't hidden, as they would say, as John Hagee would say, that they were supposed to reject it because... It was hidden to them, no, because he came in the fullness of the book, as David said. So, you know, that that's because they were a hidden revelation, they'll have a hidden rapture and all this, because in his mind, it's irrelevant what happens to the gents, because it was never about them to begin with. And... Remember, he invited his own people to be um, guests to the wedding, but they all gave their regrets, and he went to the highways and byways and found um, people from way out on the outskirts. Which aren't in the walls proper. <laughs> Besides, um, there was an angel that had told... Uh, Zechariah to tell the man that was going to measure the walls of the temple to not build any walls. And uh, that was because God was going to deliver them and save them and to for them to have faith. But what do people do? In, in calling themselves God, they try to do it themselves. And in that way, they're taking away from what Christ did, who was God, and he did it himself, and they're putting on them, basically claiming to be messiahs of, in of themselves to fulfill God's will, to be God's arm. And this is sacrilege, plain and simple. And anybody that tries to 
for every fulfillment of Scripture in the future is taking away from the work of Jesus, where he said his hour has come, now the prince of the air must be cast down. Well, in Ephesians 2, 2, he said, you know, they were servants to the power of the air, but now they, they aren't, you know, because they've been given this crown to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So, um, the judgment would be 70 AD, and that would be the burial, when when the, the Romans would, would bury uh, all the old way, and there would be no more temple. So, all the things of the Torah had ended at that point, um, and Daniel had been fulfilled, that he would cut off the covenant and everything, because no longer would a sacrifice bring them any closer to cover their sins, because they had given the ultimate sacrifice of something holy that God had himself offered to cleanse them. So they have that as long as they become the offerers of it, and the only way they can offer it is by removing the priest, by having the the blood on their own hands. But um, to, to spill that uh, blood would be... Uh, keeping the law and to not would be breaking it according to Ezekiel 33 that they um or Ezekiel 34 that they ate, ate blood as the as the nations did and uh Paul didn't want people to eat blood not necessarily because he believed in the law but because he didn't want to pe people who were new in the law to be disheartened and um, think that he was a breaker of the law. They were always accusing him of that. So that was a real sensitive topic at the time. But Paul knew, as uh, he said in Corinthians, about the Last Supper. And this was a very early reference to the Last Supper. And, uh, what Paul's only one, but it became significant to be the later um, put into every count of the gospel as a necessary thing. Well, I think that's very significant for um, Ezekiel 33, Ezekiel 34, uh, Numbers 14, and uh, as well as all. All kinds of places in, in 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 the Torah where they had said that these people devour these these, these people the nations devour men that they but they did they sacrificed people but the Torah coming from that said yes that's true except redeem them with uh, an animal that's perfect well the, an animal that's perfect actually then thereby brought them near to God when they were separate. And so, it's because of their sins, according to Ezekiel 33, that they must die, and according to, to uh, Deuteronomy, and according to James. So, the, the death, as they accused Jesus of, under the law, and he was perfect under law, is granted to them. That, as it said in uh, John 5, 45, Do not think that I come to accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. So remember how he said, judge not lest ye be judged, the, the miter, the meter or whatever that you uh, use to base other judgment on, it will be used to, but the Gentiles didn't accuse the Yehudim of being um, guilty of the law, under the law. They gave them, you know, let them set up Herod, their, their king, and um, gave them a uh, sim uh, semblance of, of power to, you know, whip people 39 times if the law so desired. And, you know, even with Jesus, they said, I can't, you know, Pilate said, I'm not going to decide this. My wife came to me and was like, he had done nothing wrong. I'm, this, is, this is beyond me, and um, you can decide. So, yes, they did judge him under their law. Um, Matthew would say maybe false accusations, or Mark would say false accusations, but... I mean, John does say false accusations, but the depth of it is that they believed that they were accusing him under the law. And so 
they say in John 10 that he, you know, they want to stone him because he was making himself, you know, right hand of God. And so, but he's referred to their own law and that scripture can't be unbroken. And Paul went further to talk about the adoption that David had. Uh, anybody can be as the son of God, whether and regardless of their birth lineage or whatever. And remember, David wasn't a descendant of Paul. The, he, the high priest's lineage had changed numerous times. The location even changed from Shiloh to Jerusalem. The people changed from the Amorites to the Israelites. So it seemed that he can change the guard and by bringing in all the nations, including the lost sheep, um, the prodigal son, and um, as well as the apostles, uh, some of them like, let's say, St. Jude or St. Paul might have been, you know, from the, the ancient lost tribe, not the lost tribes, but the ancient, um, you know, new chosen people, because we see from the end of Second Kings all the way, you know, through, um, you know, to who knows where. The, um, and we saw uh, this started to happen way back in Samuel that even Ruth, you know, that um, there it was no longer the Israelites but the Judahites that um, were, were uh, you know, the, and we I showed you that part in Zechariah where he talks about the land, you know, now being called um, by their name and everything. And uh, we know Eli's wicked sons and. Ichabod, so we already know that it can change. It's not just because it was promised to be this one thing. We know in John 4, when the woman at the well said, Jacob gave this to our fathers, and we know where um, Joshua's uh, altar was, that that was the perfect opportunity for Jesus to say, well, actually, it's, this, this, this isn't the place you think it is. And Remember, he said, you will go to Samaria and all that. Well, I thought he wasn't going to go to Samaria. I thought Ezra said there were nobodies. I thought that's what Zerubbabel thought. And, um... Uh, I had gone over Second Kings 17 and a bunch of other stuff in my prior videos. So I don't really want to tarry there. Um, right now. So, uh, let's just move it forward. Before I get into, um, I, um, the rest of John 12 and, uh, Isaiah 51, Isaiah 52, and how that relates to, um, Ezekiel chapters 33 to 36 and whatnot, um, I want to just briefly say that the millennium would therein be the Christianization of Jerusalem. That that's the millennium. And whether it's supposed to last 3,000 years and didn't um, is really something that couldn't have been known then. Um, but with hundreds of years transpiring with Christ with with hundred years or a couple hundred years transpiring with Jerusalem becoming more and more Christian, one would speculate that this could go on and continue and strengthen for a thousand years or two and to an unknown uh, uh, period of time, basically implying that it won't end until something new that nobody could possibly foresee come along. And, uh, this would be the the living um, the living situ the life situation of the the people of that time when this these things were finalized a couple hundred years later and whether it was written two hundred years prior in this prophecy is a big debate for a lot of things. Daniel in chapter seven goes through. Or maybe chapter eight, uh, yeah, basically chapters five through um, eight goes through great detail in describing 
events that transpired in the hundreds of years following that in such perfect, astute detail that it's either the most amazing prophecy of all time or it was a history. Uh, and by using a bunch of symbols does not mean that it wasn't a history, but that's just how the style was written to show prophetic literature that God's in charge. So that's what Daniel 4 is really about, how God's in charge of who's in power and how Babylon had the rise and fall. But it's not going to talk about much the fall of Persia in a meaningful way because Persia wasn't supposed to fall according to the Old Testament because Cyrus was one of the sheep. He was the Messiah. He was probably Semitic by the line of the Medes. And uh, that Messiah had saved the people and they had rebuilt their city uh, and made you know the people the nations uh, handmaids and servants as it says in uh, Isaiah 14 too and uh, I wanted to get to um, 2 Peter 3.15 I said that a couple videos ago I wanted to hit that let's do it right now uh, it says, Bear in mind that the Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with wisdom that God gave. So his patience is salvation. He was long-suffering with his people. He let them take his life. He laid down his life, but he didn't take it. He let them take it. And be out of love uh, to save them, just as the Lamb... Uh, it was Isaiah 53 and all the Torah was dumb to what was happening to him. So in Semitic culture, they even put the knife behind their back, you know, uh, because they think that's good luck for this surprise or whatever. Um, but it says, uh, so, so basically when they would stray Christ, this is emblematic of um, the fall of Jerusalem because they didn't want Jerusalem to be taken. So they burned it, their own city. They, they killed their own Messiah is, is what that means. They, they basically, God never said, if you go to this, this uh, other God's, your unfaithful wife, I'm just going to wipe you out and find somebody new because if I can't have her, nobody can. No, he let her go and was saying, when you're done with him, come back to me and then um, we'll fall back in love again or whatever. Um, so... But they rejected him in death, so they didn't, when, when God put them away, they didn't, you know, repent, they didn't yearn for him or anything as was supposed to happen in Deuteronomy. But he never divorced, um, or however you look at it, um, because they always thought that when everyone serves us, we will be as gods. But God came as a servant. So by being the ideal man, he showed them how to be. But they didn't see it because they weren't thinking godly. Well, God was long-suffering with them. God was never going to abandon them. God was patient with them. And for that reason, faithfulness would come by being godly. And how would they be godly? By coming as a servant, by suffering long. That's what God did for them. But they didn't want that. They didn't want to be godly. They wanted to have God's power as, you know, he's... He was going to punish all the other people and he was going to want to be served and he was jealous and all that. That was their idea of God. The the God that, you know, was going to bring them back. That was in their minds uh, schema far from what they were thinking, you know. And because they didn't have the faith in God that he loved them and cared for them and would provide for them, they missed the point when Jesus came and promised them glory, but they saw the death only. They didn't see the resurrection.